How's everybody doing today after a break? How's the energy? Good? All right, all right, all right. This is gonna be fun. I'm um, really honored to be here uh, with Kai and Wes, as well as all of you. My name is Kristen Hostetter. I'm the head of sustainability and community partnerships at Outside Interactive. We are a media tech company um, that owns brands that you may know, like Outside, Backpacker, Climbing, Ski, Gaia Trail Forks, um, Pink Bike, all those brands. Um, and I have been an editor in that space for about 25 years. I recently just kind of was able to harness my passions and turn them into this head of sustainability and community partnerships role, uh, which I'm really excited about. And it's also been the culmination of um, a sort of a passion of mine for several years, which is this thing that I think we can all um, feel united around, which is a hatred for single-use plastic, yeah. right? Do we all agree that we are not fans of single-use plastic? <laughs> about four years ago, I founded the Plastic Impact Alliance, which is a coalition of about 400 um, outdoor industry brands, companies, PR agencies, nonprofits, on a journey to eliminate single-use plastic from their businesses. Through that work, I got to know Wes and the work that he's doing through a New Earth project. Um, and I don't want to actually steal Wes's thunder. I want to let him introduce himself and Kai introduce himself. And then we're going to have a really interesting conversation about why a packaging company and an incredible athlete are up here on the same, sharing a stage together and sharing a message. So Wes, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, yeah, I'm Wes Carter. I'm the president of Atlantic Packaging. Uh, we are the largest <clears throat> privately held industrial packaging company in North America. Uh, my grandfather, Horace Carter, founded the company in 1946. Um, and um, I am now a founder of a New Earth Project, which is a mission um, that we launched uh, almost two years ago now uh, to rid our world's oceans, lakes, and rivers of plastic pollution. Um, and we're really working closely with the outdoor industry uh, to catalyze that message and influence the greater supply chain to make these shifts. So that's me. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kai Lenny. I'm a professional water athlete and fortunate to have been born and raised on the island of Maui in Hawaii. And I think where I fit into this as an athlete and especially as somebody that, you know, lives and breathes everything on the ocean. Um, m most of my life, actually my entire life, I've seen plastic pollution on the beaches and we've done big beach cleanups and uh, even all the equipment we get usually comes in plastic. And so linking up with Wes and a new earth project's been amazing because we're moving into that direction of more sustainable packaging for not only the equipment that I use, but for the rest of the world. So we can keep those waves that we absolutely love riding every day, you know, the same for future generations and not have it just slowly fade away. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Okay, well, great. I think, um, you know, one thing that I've heard time and time again over the last 24 hours or 36 hours that I've been here um, that I think everyone in this room is trying to do is create a movement, right? Like to get the larger population um, out there to be hearing um, our ideas for solutions to these problems. And, um, and I think um, one of the things that we want to talk about here today is the fact that, um, you know, Wes is a packaging company. I mean, they, they, they don't make packaging, but they distribute a part of the supply chain and has formed this, I think, pretty unlikely relationship um, with an athlete. And, um, you know, because Wes has identified the idea that in order to make this change to more reusable, um, sustainable packaging, we have to have a platform. We have to have an audience, right? Yep. Um, and so... Um, so, you know, Wes talks a lot, you talk a lot about making packaging sexy, sustainable yeah. packaging sexy. Good luck with that. Yeah, it's been tough. <laughs> right? There's a lot of consumers who just aren't, aren't with you on that. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about that. Um, you know, how do we make packaging sexy? How do we make sustainable packaging engaging for consumers? How do we get people fired up about it? Um, and, you know, more and more, especially on the backside of COVID, the awareness around packaging is at an all time high. I mean, I think that was one of the silver linings of the last few years is because we all got so much packaging to our homes, 
regular people all around the world started asking more questions about what is recyclable and where, what do I do with all this stuff? And so that awareness is really what we're trying to capitalize on. And we're, we want people to really engage and ask those kind of questions. And so uh, it's created a tremendous amount of innovation in our industry. I, in the last two years, I've seen more new sustainable pa packaging products come to market than I have in my whole career. And so we're trying to capitalize on, on that momentum with a new earth project and engaging with athletes like Kai, really not to push a product. You know, we're not asking these athletes to push a product. We're as asking them to really catalyze a mission because at the end of the day, you know, it takes more than just an enlightened group of people to make this shift. It has to be a global shift. And I, I think the only way that happens is through really changing hearts and minds of everyday regular people. And, you know, people like Kai have an incredible platform and young people look up to a guy like him. And so we're asking him to use that influence to help us, you know, ignite passion and catalyze the mission. Right. So Kai's got over a million followers on Instagram, just to give you an idea mm -hmm. of the of the of the reach that he has. But, I've got 2000. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm about there with you. Um, Kai, what can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to um, to this relationship with the New Earth? Well, Project. so um, Peter King, who's in the back, connected Wes and I, and Peter King's a prolific filmmaker in the surfing world, and he's always been an advocate for change um, positively in the sense of sustainability. And I think as surfers, um, you know, as a professional athlete, and I mentioned this before, it's like you get so much stuff, you know, for your companies and you end up getting a lot of this plastic stuff. And how could we like actually be the ones to change um, the paradigm and actually have um, the stuff that we need to use and uh, and we end up breaking and whatever, but have it be sustainable and good for the environment and not have an impact. But I guess with these guys, it just was really interesting because um, not only could I get equipment shipped across the world, brand new stuff, but I can actually reuse that packaging to you know, put it in my board bags or continue to travel. And um, to me, I think there's always been a stigma around um, sustainability being like this big effort, you know, and I don't think it actually is that big of an effort if everyone sort of gets on board. Um, and, and so I think kind of getting over that sort of stigma and then making it cool in the way where it's just normal, like you just sort, sort of normalize that. And that could be, I mean, where I sort of have a place in it is just making my everyday life. It just seemed like, oh, of course, this is how I would do it. Why wouldn't anyone else? And it's really up to the next generation now to be like, oh, yeah, of course, that's how we move the needle forward. This is what we got to do. Um, and, and to me, you know, it's like, I think, uh, you know, we do these massive beach cleanups where we'll pull, you know, four tons of trash off of a single beach. And plastic nowadays is so small, especially when it ends up in the ocean. And you look at this beautiful blue ocean, and this happened recently when I was between Oahu and Kauai. This is a 96 mile channel. You look out in this like 10,000 feet of just perfectly blue water. But if you look really close, you see little pieces of plastic floating everywhere. And most of the trash we pick up is from, you know, the bigger countries or the larger cities that are on waterways and um, Asian countries. I mean, you're still picking up trash from that tsunami that hit Japan in 2011. And, uh, and so a lot of the trash that ends up in Hawaii to the beaches that have some of the best waves on earth, it's not even from there. So it's kind of like frustrating and trying to figure out, okay, we could clean up the beaches constantly and it feels good in the moment, but how do you turn off the faucet? And um, Wes and his team are figuring out how to turn off the faucet. And, you know, I want to be a, uh, a soundboard for them, some ideas, but then also be able to like share what they're doing so that everyone could get behind it. And it'll be one of those things where we could all talk about, like, remember that one time we used to have plastic? That's yeah. so weird. It's like, <laughs> why would anyone ever do that? I mean, I think there's a lot of things in the world that's like that now. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, no, I'm really stoked to be with these guys and, you know, getting other professional athletes that have influence behind it. Yeah, so it occurs to me that maybe, you know, we've been, we've been um, talking about your, your new surfboard packaging for quite some time, but it occurs to me that maybe this audience doesn't know it, it would make sense to talk about what surfboards used to be packaged in and what your new solution is. Would that, would that make sense to everyone? Yes, I mean, yeah? yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of surfers here, so maybe you know this, but I think it's, 
It's yeah, I can talk why about that. it's different, fiber based, well, you know, et cetera. And, and I'll give it a little background. I mean, the reality is for a packaging company like Atlantic, I mean, you know, our primary customers are Procter and Gamble, Coca-Cola, Kellogg's, I mean, large consumer products companies. So engaging in surfboard packaging from a business perspective was not something that we would have typically done. <laughs> There's just not enough surfboards to really move the needle. But you know, a new earth project really sort of enlightened me as we got into this. It was like, you know, surfboards are engaging for people. You know, if I didn't, if I made a documentary series about packaging industrial shelving, nobody's watching that. <laughs> you know? So, you know, we said, what if we use surfboards, not you know, as an example of what can be done. So traditionally surfboards are kind of a disaster. They are wrapped in foam. They are wrapped in bubble wrap. They've got tons of, you know, polypropylene tape wrapped around it. It's kind of a nightmare. There's pieces of corrugated. They're cut on the tail and the nose. It's slid into a box. It's stuffed full of paper. First of all, it takes forever to pack one. If you ask anybody who makes surfboards, packaging one takes like 25 minutes. You know, it's not efficient at all. And then when it gets to your house, and again, more and more surfboards are shipped to people's homes. It, it, it takes 25 minutes to unpack it and you have to have a razor blade. It's just kind of a nightmare and none of the packaging is recyclable. It all ends up in the landfill. So it was sort of a perfect case study in this is a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> Let's you know, re-engineer it. And because our packaging company is a very technical packaging company, we have a, a world-class packaging solution center in Charlotte. We do a lot of packaging design. We had the resources to take that package. We did a whole unboxing experience and we documented the whole thing. We weighed the packaging so we knew exactly how much plastic we had. And then we spent several months really looking at how can we do this? Not only, you know, we, we wanted it to be fully sustainable. We wanted it to be 100% curbside recyclable, but we also wanted it to be easier. We wanted it to be easier to pack. We wanted it to protect the surfboard better because quite honestly, the way it was being done, a lot of surfboards were still getting damaged. You know, so we wanted it. And then we also wanted to, optimize the size, you know, because we knew that if we went to fiber-based packaging, which is basically paper packaging, that it would probably be a little bit more expensive. But if we could optimize the size of the packaging, we could offset that, you know, with the shipping costs. So we took all those things into account and we came up with the first ever fully sustainable surfboard pack that we brought to market. We partnered with John, with John Pazel, you know, out of uh, Hawaii, and he was really great in, you know, letting us, you know, understand how, how their operations worked. And, uh, and we brought that to market. And so, and the cool thing was we documented that whole process. We, you know, we shipped the surfboards to famous surfers like Kai Lenny and John John Florence and let them open them and got their reactions on film. And the really cool thing about that whole process was my customers like Anheuser-Busch and Kellogg's, they watch that. And they're like, that is so cool what y'all are doing. And it had the effect that I'd hoped it would have is it was an example of what could be done. And we did it with the backdrop of surfing. So everyone paid attention and watched it. And it, and it begins to influence the rest of the supply chain to look at other examples of what can be done. So um, it, it, it gave me faith that we were on the right path. Yeah, good. And if anyone um, uh, wants to learn more about that process, there's a great um, documentary series that A New Earth Project has uh, produced. It's called Journey to a New Earth, and you can find it out there on many of your favorite streaming channels. I highly recommend it. Um, it's very informative and really fun to watch, too, because as you said, it's, it's about surfing. It's about, it's about fun stuff. Um, but again, I think this is just this. This is a really interesting relationship, right, between a packaging company and an athlete. And Kai, you obviously have relationships with a lot of sponsors. How is the relationship with a New Earth Project in Atlantic different? The same? Um, what are the sort of the nuts and bolts of that? And and how do you how do you view that through your through your lens? I look at working with a New Earth Project as less as a sponsor and more kind of a movement kind of trying to share this idea and this the influence that these guys have with others that can kind of benefit us all. And um, it's actually really cool because in just talking with them, I can actually bring them to my other sponsors and help them have more sustainable packaging and you know have that process of building the equipment, shipping the equipment be a little bit even more thought out. Because I mean, at the end of the day, it's about moving numbers and stuff, but um, I think like he's mentioned, the whole goal is to, at the same time, be able to do it sustainably and why not make sustainability actually the premier product 
um, for everything we do, you know? Why not have that be the premium, what people want? And not premium in price, but like um, performance. And even with our equipment, I think there's a lot to be evolved to get rid of the styrofoams within the board, the polyester, the polyurethane. I mean, there is definitely ways and there are people doing amazing things. And I think this is literally kind of a, um, a door to many other doors that will open up in the future. And as a sport that is so based around, you know, your soul of going out and riding a wave and feeling good, um, there's no reason why all of this high performance things that I'm trying to accomplish as an athlete, you know, can't be backed and, you know, helped with, um, you know, having these sustainable stuff. But um, I think what I look forward to most is seeing how this all evolves and seeing the individuals that kind of join this cause and where we're able to eventually take it because I think it'll, you know, just eventually be something we don't think about <laughs> or we're not worried about. It'll just be standard living. And I think the hardest thing nowadays is trying to get people to change. Like change in itself is kind of hard. So making it so people don't have to change as much. It just becomes like maybe somebody else in the background changes one little thing like packaging. And then all of a sudden that person's um, waste that goes out into these monstrous landfills, like all of a sudden that mountain just doesn't get any bigger. And, you know, they're using it for something else or, you know, like the packaging that these guys are creating, like if I'm not reusing it in a board bag in my garden, I'm laying the cardboard down to put the food that we're planting in the backyard. So um, that feels good rather than being like, God, I got all this styrofoam and all this stuff that I'm putting in the trash. You just feel guilty every time mm -hmm. you do it. And no one wants to feel that. So, so how do you get those, um, those thoughts across to your audience? Like how, how exactly do you, I think without trying for me, you know, I think the art of trying to sell a product, not like trying to be forcing it on it, not making it seem like it's an ad or whatever, you know, it's like making it authentic and how I use it personally. Like that's the thing with every single sponsor that I have and every product that I use, I do believe in the brand. I do believe in the people and um, making it be like, well, the reason why I use this stuff is because I just think it's the best and I'm going to get the most out of it. And, you know, it's very personal in that sense as being a professional athlete that's not on a team, that is an individual that goes out and kind of a selfish pursuit of just wanting to score epic waves. Um, that, you know, there's no reason why, like, if I just lead by example what I'm doing in my life, then other people might catch on and want to do it themselves and be like, oh yeah, of course, why wouldn't you do it that way? And making something cool is like making something that resonates with somebody else. Um, so when people like, it's as simple as like, in maybe one of my videos, I'm packing my boards to go somewhere and someone sees this cardboard wrap around. They're like, they wanna know more about that. And I get all these messages all the time on the littlest things. I'm like, how did you guys catch that? But I'm glad like you're like catching what? that, you know? Like oh, what? it's like how I pack a board bag, you know? As simple as that. And to me, it's like, I'm just trying to pack as fast <laughs> as I can so I can go ride a big wave somewhere. <laughs> um, and, and, and so it's like, well, okay, I use this, I use that, you know? I, the, this, you guys should check out, you know, Journey to a New Earth, you know, this probably inform you a little bit more like what's going on. And mm -hmm. hey, I'm not the only pro surf that wants to do it. Everyone's favorite other pro surfers are doing this too. And, and making it in such an authentic way. That's, I think, how you get to a larger audience. And um, sometimes it's, uh, it's, you have to believe in the product. And I believe in what yeah. these guys are doing, because I have to, I go to the beach every day. And you know, one thing that we've been having in Hawaii a lot is like back in the day when they were taking all the sand to make concrete in the cities and stuff ruined a lot of ways because you need sand to fill in. So it's like those little things that, you know, if you can make a small difference somewhere, it's going to have a huge impact mm -hmm. later on. And I think this is the same scenario. I mean, we want to go pick up shells on the beach, not pieces not of plastic. <laughs> right, right. And um and, and Wes, you told me earlier, like, this is working. Like, this idea of partnering with people like Kai and Kelly Slater, it's working, right? How, can you, how do you know that's working? Can you tell us a little about that? You know, we're in a really fortunate position as an organization. Like I mentioned before, we're so integrated into the supply chain. And honestly, that was the big moment for me personally when I realized, you know, like, 
we have a seat at the table with all these major consumer products companies. We already have a reputation for being a technical company that they rely on. If we embrace sustainability and it becomes the ethos of how we go to market, we could really have a pretty big impact, you know? And so it's been very intentional on our part. And like I said, these organizations more and more are paying attention to sustainability from the, the, the perspective of, of it being a brand attribute. You know, like companies more and more are aware that they are being judged ethically as a brand on packaging. And historically, that wasn't true. Packaging was about getting it from point A to point B without it breaking, basically. But now, because of sustainability, because of this radical amount of awareness about, you know, global plastic pollution, brands are beginning to shift. And, and, and I have seen companies, large companies, make shifts away from single-use plastic 100% in a quarter, over three month period of time, shifting 100%. That's radical. I've never seen anything like that before for any reason, but that that is that is what's going on right now. So that's something that's really encouraging to me. And another thing I'll bring up, I mean, one of the things that I think is you, you cannot under um, emphasize is the power of social media. You know, we, we, we talk about the ills of social media a lot, and I have young kids, so you know, if you have young kids, you talk about it a lot more. But to me, we are living in an era that is unlike anything in human history. We can catalyze a movement globally in real time. That is, I mean, that is an amazing, awesome tool. And so what we've tried to do with people like Kai is really catalyze their influence and create really compelling content you know, to, to activate passion, to ignite passion and, you know, create movements because the only thing at the end of the day that will move big companies to make these changes really is consumer demand. It's a little sad, you know, it's not, you know, we wish it was all ethics, but at the end of the day, consumer demand moves the needle more than anything else. And the power of social media to catalyze that to me is an epically important thing. Yeah. Um. Kai, here's a question for you. I think um, there's there's several athletes in this room, many athletes in this room, and um, and um, and every everybody cares about something. Like we all have our our you know our sort of our our pet causes. But what's your what's your message to fellow athletes or influencers who who feel like they really want to leverage their audience, um, but don't really know, you know where to turn or what to what to jump what bandwagon there's so many different causes you can jump onto is there is there any advice you'd have for other influencers to kind of harness that you know i think for me i um the how i ended up on this stage with wes with this major packaging company that's doing this incredible thing within my own endemic industry of surfing um and then them taking that and going beyond in order to do something really big, I think you got to start pretty small. And for me, it was um, starting off locally. Like, how could you make a large impact um, as you know a popular athlete just in your hometown? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like starting off doing a little beach cleanup with my friends, and then getting more people to come do that. Then working with, looking at, okay, this is kind of my goal. I want to make sure all the beaches that I go to, where all my friends go to, where everyone loves to surf is clean and it starts off that small and then it's like hmm can we do the entire state and then these project ideas kind of come up and then reaching out to um, local organizations like sustainable coastlines in hawaii which you know they're they're always doing these major cleanups and i'm like hey can i can i do something where i do every single sport across every major channel in hawaii and every island i land on we'll do a massive beach cleanup with the local community because i've always been a huge believer that um, in order to change the world, you kind of got to start in your own hometown and you got to start small and, um, and, and make it digestible because when you're trying to save, if you're trying to save the whole world, like taking that whole world on your shoulders, like, it's like, where do you even start? Like, and, and especially now that with social media, we're able to reach such far corners of the world. Um, you know, you can actually have a huge impact on inspiring a lot of other people kids and a lot of people influencers whoever it may be to go out in their hometown and i think that's like the message that i want to get across is like wow it's actually that easy for me to go just do in the place that i love or you know i want to support my own town and if everyone sort of does that you can make a big difference and then integrating what i love to do into these fun projects which is a test of my athleticism going between all these islands and then 
you know, not stopping there, but picking up about 4,000 pieces of, you know, trash in a day is like, it's exhausting, but you might find treasure in there, you know, like the cool thing about, you know, in all of this, somebody on Molokai found a uh, glass ball from, God, it must have been made in the 1800s that was floating out in the ocean forever. And they used to use these glass balls as buoys. Now it sucks because if you find these buoys from, you know, Japan or these Asian countries, it's all plastic. And it's like, ah, oh, it was like, it was just gold to be able to find these glass floating balls. And a lot of times they would just turn into sand on the beaches. But if you found one up in the bushes, like someone ended up finding it and it was a cool find. And so there was like, a lot of people got stoked about that, like finding treasure in all the trash. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so like, yeah, to kind of wrap this whole thing up, it's like, and to get to this point, to, to go in bigger and, you know, working with these guys to actually having sponsors like Red Bull make a packaging specific for Hawaii, like starting hometown, yeah. I think like inspires more people than being like, hey, I'm in this initiative that's, you know, they're changing the world this way. And everyone's like, it's so broad and so big. It's like, how can you, how can I make a difference? Yeah. But it has to start in the hometown is my belief. Yeah. Wes, um, what advice would you have for other brands looking? We talked a little bit earlier about this is a unique ar arrangement um, in terms of, I guess, an, a, an athlete sponsorship. Sure. Um, talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of your agreement with Kai and how it's different from sort of maybe the classic athlete brand sponsorship. And then maybe what advice you would have for other brands looking to, to find, you know, a representative or an ambassador like Kai that's so mission aligned. Um, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've thought a lot about this and, and I really think that, you know, we've articulated a little bit in this discussion, but that there, we've sort of found a kind of a new lane for elite athlete advocacy where, Traditionally, it was promoting a product, and there's still a lot of that done, which is great. You know, we, these guys are going to spo get sponsorships and promote products, or maybe they were aligning with a nonprofit, you know, who was raising awareness. But this new lane of actually partnering with organizations within the supply chain, and a lot of the companies here, like, you know, that are bringing new products to market, like aligning with brands and companies that are actually part of the supply chain to promote a mission feels like a new lane to me. Um, and a really important one too. And that's why I think this is, is so effective because it's sort of new. Um, and so we've continued to try to capitalize on that. Um, and, you know, there was a, you know, there wasn't, the way that we all got connected, honestly, was we were really passionate about what we were doing. Uh, everyone in Atlantic, you know, was outspoken about our uh, mission to be the most sustainable packaging company in the world and really help transition the supply chain. Um, and through all that, I got connected to Peter King, you know, and Peter uh, has been an incredible partner along this road. And Peter was passionate about what we were doing too. And, you know, we sort of had a conversation two years ago and it was like, we, he, Peter has access to the professional surfing community. These people are passionate about clean oceans. How do we connect their voices and their influence with the supply chain? And the way to do that is through the private sector, through organizations like us. And so once we married those two things together, it really began to flourish. So, I mean, I do think part of it is getting your message out, getting your message out there and then, you know, finding folks that are engaged with those communities uh, and getting access to these people. Because what I have found in outdoor sports, you know, far and away, Guys like Kylie, they're passionate about this already. You know, like you don't have to create the passion. It's there. It's just giving their voices an entree into the supply chain. So every organization that's here, my guess is there's an elite athlete that would love to be associated with you. It's just a matter of connecting those dots. Right. And being authentic about it, too. Being authentic yeah. about it. I mean, yeah. I think that's the most important thing. I mean, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, like, I, you know, greenwashing, greenwashing. I'm like, we're the anti-greenwashers. Like that, I'm trying to be the, you know, we're trying to be truth in packaging. And we, where we sit in the supply chain is between the manufacturers of packaging and the users of packaging. So by, by our very design, we have the ability to be really impartial. And I feel like that's what the supply chain needs is an impartial arbitrator. So, mm -hmm. but you know, people can see through inauthenticity. And so we, we've tried to continue to be authentic and we don't always have all the right answers, of course, and we continue to learn and evolve. And, and that's a part of the journey as well. Yeah. Um, okay, final question for both of you, kind of just a fun off, uh, off the serious topic one, but um, what are you most proud of? 
Wes? I am the most proud, honestly, of the team that we've assembled. Um, that has been one of the amazing benefits, you know, that has been just so inspiring for me as, as we catalyze this mission, just the most talented, amazing human beings just started showing up and saying, how can I contribute? I want to be a part of what you're doing. We are, we believe in what you're doing. How can we contribute? And um, today, and a lot of those folks are sitting right here on the second row, um, we just have the most talented, unique group of humans that are all working together, that really care about what we're doing. And um, it's enriched my life. And I'm just really proud of what a New Earth Project represents and, and, and what it can possibly do. Um, so yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> Good answer. How about you, Kai? What are you most proud? You know, I think as a professional athlete and as, you know, career goals, of course, you know, you want to be world champion. You want to do these sort of things. You want to ride the biggest wave ever, you know, um, you know, your kids are number one in everything. But I think as far as like some of the best moments that I've ever had is really just sharing what I love to do with other people. Um, and the differences that can make in other people's lives, um, you know, working with bringing out kids in knee high waves and introducing them to the passion of the ocean and, uh, and riding a wave with them. That's almost more exhilarating and exciting and fun to me than necessarily going out and riding the biggest wave of my life. I mean, that is what I love to do, of course, but, um, you know, I always thought if you're ever going to care for the ocean, you have to have some sort of stake in it. And the stake is, you know, a passion for something in it. It could be surfing, it could be the kite surfing, it could be winging, it could be anything that just involves being in the water and all of a sudden somebody has a reason to care about it. Otherwise, you know, you're in these big cities and uh, you know, if, if it's just this kind of outside of your normal life's thing, you're, why would you care about it? So making people passionate about it. Um, and you know, that's literally seeing the stoke and joy of people that get into the water. It's, you know, it's something that I'll want to do forever. And, uh, and so when someone does come up and say they're inspired by what I'm doing, whether it's working with these guys or, you know, just for being who I am doing what I love to do. Yeah. That's, that's the best feeling on earth. You know, it feels like winning a championship or something. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm sure you all have some questions for these gentlemen, so fire away. Yes. Um, thanks everyone. Sorry. Um, so as a small business owner, Wes is more so for you. Um, I'm actually wearing like my clothing right here. How would I like, in terms of like getting the right products made or the shipping products made, how as a small business owner can I make sure that's happening? Because obviously I'm in the Gen Z category and I'm working selling to a lot of like friends and family and, and whoever like my brand and they're obviously going to be expecting like like sustainable packaging and, and so forth but i found already like even just scaling my little business it's been difficult to uh go that route i'll give you my card um <laughs> no um you know we we recognize that um smaller startup brands and medium-sized brands were going to be the organizations that were going to lead this shift you know, the bigger organizations, it's just a lot harder for them, if nothing else. And they've got to have the desire to do it. So we've really embraced, you know, what typically wouldn't have been a market that we would have paid a lot of attention to just because of the size and scale of it. But with the New Earth Project, we've been really um, deliberate about embracing people just like you. So one of the things we did um, when we launched our website, uh, newearthproject.com, we, we created a, a group of products that we're calling New Earth Approved. And we have those products that we inventory all over the country. We buy them in bulk. We've come up with stock sizes and we put together a Shopify website. I have never in my life sold any packaging over online. This is the first time we ever did it, but it was for companies just like yours. So you don't have the size and the scale, but we're gonna give you a Shopify catalog with, I think we've got close to 60 products on there now um, that are all New Earth approved. And we go through what that means. It means the products are made from renewable resources. They're curbside recyclable pretty much anywhere there's a blue bin. And if they do end up in the environment, they're gonna break down in eight to 12 weeks. I mean, those are sort of our criteria. And then we have that whole catalog of products that you can order from. So um, we have, we've done our best to try to provide the resources of a very large packaging company to guys just like you. 
And all we ask for in exchange is that we can tell your story on social media and promote your brand. Yeah. Memory lane. Memory lane. <laughs> Somebody write that down. <laughs> Um, so for you guys, I've listened to some of your work in the past. Um, and one thing I know you talk about is the little, like, desire to be a legacy. So I just want to know, like, outside of being known as one of the greatest like, water men of all time, what is, like, the legacy you want to be known for? Um, yeah, what, in terms of, like, impact of the world or just you, like, what is, like, really close to your heart? I mean, you know, I it's hard to say what I, you know, I think it's, like, when someone gives you a nickname and you know, if you say you don't like it necessarily, it's gonna stick. And then if you really want to leave something a certain way, it's probably gonna be something completely different. So, you know, for me, I don't necessarily think about like, you know, I kind of look at um, people like Duke Hanamoku as kind of the perfect ambassador. Somebody who's like, okay, this guy won gold medals at the Olympics, brought surfing to the world, but his whole demeanor and how he kind of approached his life was so Hawaiian and so Aloha spirit. He just wanted to go out and ride waves and then share that passion with other people, share that Aloha spirit. Um, so I use him a lot to kind of reference where I want to go. You know, these are the things that I want to do and accomplish on a personal level. Like, okay, I want to ride the biggest wave of my life. I want to break these records. I want to, you know, win world championships in multiple different sports. Like, that's all great. That's like personal goals. It's important to have purpose in life something to like chase after. It's like really the journey, not the destination at the end of the day. And, um, but if there is like a legacy, it's kind of what um, guys like Duke Hanamoku instilled in others, which is, you know, doing stuff for others, having a lot of fun along the way and, um, and um, being a good person for, first and foremost, um, kind of leaving wherever you were better than you found it sort of thing. Um, so, you know, whatever people, you know, come to the conclusion on me, hopefully it's just as long as it's always positive, I'm pretty stoked because mm -hmm. got a short time here to do a lot of things. So trying to press on and uh, hopefully inspire other people to go out and just do what they love to do, regardless if it's in the water or not. Like just having the passion to go after something that seems daunting. And that's why I'm pretty open about the stuff that I do. I'm okay being a beginner 100% of the time. Because when you're a beginner, you know, you learn so much more and it's natural for everyone not to, you know, be the best at everything all the time. And that's me for sure. You know, it's like it's it's about, um, you know, pursuing goals that are seem unattainable. And then afterwards be like, oh, that wasn't too bad. What's next? Like keep climbing that ladder in your own mind sort of thing. So, yeah, it, hopefully that sums it up. <laughs> It's okay to clap. Yay, that was a good answer. <laughs> Hi there. I'm coming in cold to your organization. I just love it. I mean, incredible. Thank you for your time. Um, I have about 17 questions. I'll keep it to two. Um, one, um, what was the cost comparison between your original packaging for a surfboard and then the paper sustainable packaging you developed? Two, do you find, do you see that there's um, legislation happening to kind of force larger consumer brands to adopt similar packaging? Or if that's still need to happen, who do I call? Um, yes, I mean, one of the, uh, historically the word sustainability also meant more expensive. Um, and, and, and that stigma has, has been around for a while. We've really worked hard. I mean, from my perspective, if it's not competitive, it's not sustainable because no one's going to buy it. So we're very cost conscious, but what we try to look at is the total cost. Like I mentioned early on, one of the things we knew that the material was going to be 10 or 15% more expensive, depending on volume. And so there's like, how do we offset that? Well, one of the ways we offset it was traditionally surfboards are packed in cartons that are defined. You know, most of these guys have three or four different sizes of cartons, which means a 5.8 and a 6.2 go in the same size box. Well, we designed a telescoping box that would slide to the exact size of the, of the board, which allowed the shipping cost to go way down. So we more than offset the cost of the material with a lower dimensional weight. And that was really intentional. So we're always looking for how do we find those you know, uh, ways to reduce cost. And, and, and so that was, a, that was a big piece of it. Um, and what was your, your follow-up question? Well, I just was curious about if that enough in itself is motivating enough to larger consumer brands to you know, like you mentioned earlier, they have to want to change and it all comes sure. down to money. So 
Yeah, the legislation. Yeah. Um, yes. The, the the answer to the question is no. It's not enough. Um, you know, it, well, it might be enough, but it won't be enough quick enough. Um, and so I do think legislation pays, plays a huge role. Um, just recently in California, they passed the first major EPR law in the United States, SB 54. Uh, it's actually one of the largest EPR laws in the world just because the population of California is so significant. And so the way EPR works, it stands for Extended Producer Responsibility, but basically it takes really problematic packaging and puts a tax on it. So you like single-use plastic will carry a really high fee. Well, that's great because when people are evaluating right now, we're using bubble wrap, but we'd like to go to a fiber-based solution, but it costs 20% more. In California, when SB 54 really goes into effect, which I think is 2026, all of a sudden the difference in those two prices is not going to be as, uh, as, as, as big. And so it will encourage brands to move to a fiber-based solution, which is a really good thing. The other part is if they don't move, well, then we're generating dollars that are 100% going to funding uh, more sophisticated recycling infrastructure and access to more recycling, especially in places like the inner city. So I'm a big supporter of EPR. You're not going to hear many people in packaging say that. Um, but again, I mean, we, I just really believe EPR can be an amazing catalyst for making this move. But I like to you know, preface that with intelligent EPR. You know, and one of, you know, we've actually spent a lot of time in Sacramento over the last few months meeting with the folks out there who got this bill passed, really encouraging them to embrace the packaging industry and get feedback from us because the worst thing that can happen to an EPR law is people who don't understand packaging start putting fees on things and it backfires. And so one of my bigger concerns with EPR is if it's done not well, that it will set us back. But you know, at least so far in California, they seem to be very open to embracing not only the, their packaging industry, but also the recycling industry. And that's another big thing, and I'll keep this brief, but historically, nobody in my industry talked to the recycling industry. You know, we didn't design packages for recycling. <laughs> you know, this is new. So what we've tried to do at Atlantic is really collaborate with the recycling. I know a lot more people in recycling today than I did two years ago. And so we're constantly talking and, you know, I'm talking to the guys that are making the robots that are going into the MRFs because I want to understand like, what is the future? You know, where, where do we need to head with packaging? So now when we're bringing packaging solutions to market, making sure that they are recyclable at the curbside is like the number one thing beyond like, will it protect the product? So again, long answer to your question, but yes, I think legislation is critical. Um, and I really hope, you know, in some southern states where I live in South Carolina, that we can begin to make this not a political issue because I've yet to find anyone who's pro pollution. You know, I haven't found that person yet who's pro pollution. So, uh, you know, these things get partisan at times, but we're hoping that over time we can begin to break down those walls. Hi, this is for Kai. Um, so I'm wondering how long ago surfers started getting interested in or worried about plastic pollution. So that's part one of the question. Part two is, uh, so I publish Good News Only newspapers in Vermont and in a couple in New Hampshire. And one of my communities is probably climate change deniers. I mean, most, mostly. So I'm wondering, but they're very much, you know, hunters, fisher, fishermen, you know, so they're out in nature. How can we reach the young people in those types of communities who might not even think about, care about plastic pollution, um, you know, to raise the awareness without it being a, a, you know, sort of a threat to whatever their political beliefs, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think surfers generally have been very protective of their home breaks. Like, you, you've heard of this term localism before, that was probably, um, you know, back in the day, you know, historically you'd have to like, it was like stepping out of society's bubble, right? And go into these different surf spots and getting almost permission to be there in a way versus just rolling up because it was like, there's only so many waves breaking at this one particular spot. But I think that intensity and localism also meant that those same people were keeping that beach clean. You know, it's like, really upset somebody, you know, at any surf break, if they saw you throwing trash on the ground or walking even past trash and not picking it up. So, I mean, for me, when I was growing up on Maui, it just seemed like a normal thing. Um, and I think, you know, answering the second part of your question, it's like, how do you create something normal versus it being a chore? You know, sometimes like when you're a kid, you get, you know, 
you have to go do some chores for your parents. And if you just went and did it, it'd probably take five, 10 minutes, but you drag <laughs> it out until it becomes this hour ordeal, you know? And it, because it feels like you're having to do something. And like, I just, I think only speaking from experience is um, naturally it just seemed like not even second thought. I'd be walking up the trail from somewhere and I'd see trash on the ground, I'd just pick it up. And there was always a trash can there. So now that moves into kind of like, now that I'm maybe a more influential person in my own community and all that, um, making sure that I'm working with organizations so there are you know trash cans at the beach. And sometimes you don't find that or recyclable place uh can trash cans as well um and in hawaii is like great at that but then they're also not so great at that surprisingly and a lot of it has come down to even like um you know companies local companies that are based on the islands that actually put out um you know trash cans or recycling bins that are branded with their logos and somehow that actually like makes a difference because people love that company, love that brand. And that's just one small way that those companies have made like impact um, just at my local beach because you never see anything on the beach and you'll probably get yelled at if you walk past a piece of trash and someone sees you from down the beach. Why wouldn't you just pick that up? Oh, I just didn't see it. It's like, well, you've got to be always like, you know, scanning the ground when you're on the beach. It's just that sort of normal thing. And I think, you know, to a local community, having athletes or people of influence, just showing by example, and, and I always try to, like I said, that talk about this a little bit earlier, but like on social media, it's like, how do I use a product or, or what is it that I'm trying to push? Like, do I do myself? And then it just becomes sort of second nature and like, um, and, and, and with water, you know, I feel like if you just really are passionate about the water and doing these sports, I think you naturally over time gravitate to wanting to clean up. So I don't know if that's a solution necessarily for, you know, the folks here, but um, that's kind of was how I ended up the way I ended up. Cause I wasn't never like forced to do it or told to do it. I guess when you're a kid, you kind of get slapped around and be like, why would you walk past that piece of trash? But it just was normal. Like it just felt so normal. It just didn't think about it. And then everyone kind of got on the same wavelength, the same pattern. But will other surfers um, have the same mindset as you? Meaning, you know, was it always, has it always been in your generation people concerned about plastic pollution or at some point did did it slowly become sort of part of people's awareness? Because when I'm thinking in the eternal community, I don't even think these young people necessarily see it, care about it. You know, so it's almost like they have to even get them to care is I guess my question in terms of did you have you know has has surfers always cared because it's in their everyday life? I think, you slowly helped I think generally everyone sort of cared, but I think now like my generation is probably one that really like go out of their way to do stuff, you know, like, okay, like let's all collectively get together and do a beach clamp, for example, or, you know, in our personal lives, how can we change a few little things? But again, it's like, there's always the local surf hero somewhere or local mountain bike or, you know, kayak or whoever it is in this community. There's always a few of those guys that all the kids look up to and whatever they do is borderline scripture to them. It's like, I want to just wear what he's wearing or she's wearing. I want to do that. And, and I think that's key. And the responsibility of like, say somebody like myself who, you know, these kids do look up to, I think it's just really important to just to really lead by example. And they just, kids will naturally gravitate to that. Cause I was that same way. The people that I looked up to, I basically sort of shadowed them as much as I could. And um, it's great having a huge, being popular and huge online presence and all that, but it only can go so far. And um, you know, a lot of pro athletes nowadays get less support in the local communities um than maybe in the past and i think that actually can be detrimental to the industry as a whole not even just like selling products but like just the communities because these people do have great influence and and can share a very positive impact on the next generation without them necessarily know they just sort of adapt to their environment and become a product of their environment so it's just about having i think really good community leaders in those areas and you know, those are the ones I think that need to be maybe influenced if not, if, if they're already, because the, the rest of the kids will want to be just like them. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. 
Okay. What, what resonates with me most about this situation is your relationship came out of a conversation with Peter King. And uh, I've lived through a situation similar where it was just this one moment in time. It allowed us access to grow our sustainable uh, adventure. And you talk about moving the needle and you talk about this isn't West, this isn't something you typically do and big companies don't really have the structure to do this. What needs to change in big companies? What cultural piece, what mechanics need to change? So clothing designers, as you, as you said, Kai, we need to start small. So small can integrate with big so there aren't as many hurdles and challenges. What needs to change in big companies so we can create more of these wonderful types of partnerships? Um, you know, at the end of the day, companies are people, you know, and, and the thing that changes more than anything is, the, is the, the passions and the interests of the people that work there. And so one of the things that's been really remarkable for me um, now that I'm well into my 40s is a lot of the people that I call on within these big organizations are younger than me now. You know, and the people, you know, people that are in their 20s and 30s and early 40s, for the most part, at least my experiences, most of them have a conscience around this stuff. And so there is, it's, I think it's less about what do we do to the companies and it's really about what do we do to culture. You know, we have to create a culture in this country and around the world that a clean planet is fundamental to life. You know, like that, ha that can't be just a fad. I mean, that has to be scripture, you know, and I believe because you know, and this goes to a little bit to the question that you were asking, this problem of plastic pollution, it's relatively new. You know, 30, 40 years ago, this really wasn't a thing. Um, and, and, and the reality is it is growing exponentially. If we don't do anything, the rate of plastic going into the ocean by 2040 will be triple what it is today. That's if we don't do anything. I mean, it is getting worse and worse and worse. So, and, and, and with social media, we have access, and just media in general, we have access to the problem. So I think some of this, the, the universe is helping us. I mean, we have access to how bad this problem is. And I think for the most part, people really care. More and more, the organizations that I deal with, they have this, this level of, of ethics that, that, that is becoming more prevalent. I do also believe that ESG plays a role you know, where from an investor perspective, when companies are being judged, at least in part on how ethical they are, that, that is a pretty good development. It's still relatively new, but you know, our entire capitalist society has really been built on judging companies primarily on profit and loss. You know, it's not as much the companies as it is the, it's the system. You know, the system rewards profit alone, but with the rise of ESG, you're beginning to have organizations that realize that th their value as a company to investors, at least in part, is on being ethical. And I think we need to continue to really, really focus on that and push that uh, within industry. Yep. Awesome. Um, I just want to say thank you both to um, Kai and Wes and to all of you leaders and change makers. It's an honor to be here. I also want to shout out Hula and Sea Change because I've been here for two and a half days now and I haven't seen any single-use plastic in the meal services, in the buildings, and um, it's the first time I've ever been to a conference like that. So how about a round of applause for that effort to this week.